deep thoughts ladies and gentlemen I came out here on this patio last night about 1 40 a.m. got recording by 2 got 40 minutes into a cool episode and the computer restarted never had that happen before and for whatever reason the temp file was erased so I have now completely figured out how to recover that even if it can't do it but I lost the audio because when I rebooted the software, it screwed it up and erased the original soundtrack for some brilliant reason. But this episode is about, it's almost as heavy as the Mandela effect, in my opinion. I'm calling it injecting history. And it goes like this, uh, you know, I've beat it around the bush because I couldn't figure out how to put this into words myself initially, but now we're here and I think I can do it on point. So a small portion of the world believes that the Mandela effect is real. I'm going to get into why I think certain events are Mandela effects and other events aren't, because the big question I keep hearing people say is, well, why this? You know, why Star Wars? Why the... Um, builder bears or whatever the hell you call them. <laughs> Berenstein bears, sorry. <laughs> the builder bears, the ones you build at the mall. The Berenstein, Berenstein, whatever. Berenstein. What we aren't asking is the overall, well, I shouldn't say we aren't asking, but we're not really deeply exploring why the Mandela effect would occur. When it first debuted, they immediately blamed the CERN Hadron Collider and saying that the high acceleration impacts coincided with people misunderstanding when Nelson Mandela died. There's also the gentleman who was in a video, I think long after the Mandela effect had been rumored to exist, wearing a Mandela sign on his chest. And what's interesting about that whole thing is you have a theory debuted in a cause already in place. That stunts the brain, doesn't it? What did you hear about this? No, I didn't hear about that. Well, it's this and it's because of that. Oh, okay, I'm done. Boom, over. But what would have happened had someone been able to reasonably suggest that the Mandela effect was occurring but not give you an answer? The vibe I'm getting is that it's extremely organic, if it occurs at all. The only other explanation of it not being real is that we have this interesting effect that occurs when we try to pre-internet pass information around through printed press, we would screw it up regionally. I think that there's enough Mandela effects now that you sort of have, I think, a few smoking guns that are a little tough to digest but this episode's about injecting history, so what the hell does that mean? Let me ask you this. When we study the JFK assassination from when we, were, when we were a kid, and believe me, I understand the retort on this, and I'm going to go both sides of the game. The biggest conspiracy was a grassy knoll shot. If there was someone in the grassy, grassy knoll in this world today, in 2018, they're not the person who took the shot. But what's interesting is, is there seems to be this slow ebb of new information that keeps coming out about the JFK assassination, almost as if the more we peer at it and into it and go down that rabbit hole, it's a fractal of new information, meaning it is infinite in its reveal of information to us. There doesn't seem to be any conclusive moment when it's like, okay, we got it. When I was a kid, there was no deaf guy above the train tracks who watched 
the 18 year old kid come out of the the weird little hole there were no CIA guys jumping off of the carts dressed like hobos with earpieces there was no kid in the rain drain the windshield didn't get hit the windshield rim didn't get hit the curb didn't get hit yes there were six seats in the one that I remember but the, the driver didn't turn around to make sure the shot happened where the guy in the passenger seat grabs the steering wheel. There wasn't uh, the missing footage of the car stopping for 11 seconds to make sure the shot took place. There wasn't the Cuban guy with the black umbrella. I could go on for fucking days. And the more you look into it, the more you look into it, there's always something else, always something else. Now, some of you could say, look, that's disinfo, or, yeah, that's what happens when you start investigating something. It just keeps revealing like a... Onion layers. But what's interesting is, is there's a correlation between the following things. JFK assassination. The line in Star Wars Empire Strikes Back, 1980. Luke, I'm your father. Or no, I'm your father. The Berenstein Bears. Sally Fields giving a speech. There is a correlation between those events. And it's the following. Those events affected society slash reality more than most events in the world. Now, the Berenstein Bears, you've got a series of books that touch the hearts of children. You know, children are psychic, amazing ab children, and then you're playing with their brains, and then you say it was one way versus the other way. Each time that franchise was pulled off the shelf and the book cover went in front of the face of a child, they had a feeling. A wonderful, positive feeling. Whether it be Berenstain, or Berenstein, or Berenstein, whatever. It might just be, okay, let's just open your mind a little bit, that each one of us have our own history. For some events, there are our history, right? My childhood was my childhood, not your childhood, and vice versa. So if we don't remember the same childhood, eh, of course, it makes mathematical sense. It makes historical sense. But almost everyone in the world, with access to a movie theater in 1980, went and saw Empire Strikes Back. So now what do we have? Nearly the entire plant heard that JFK was assassinated. Nelson Mandela was a global character, and when he died, it was a global piece of information. Now imagine you have each individual human sustaining their own reality, their own perspective, their own reality distortion field. Each individual has a, a level of frequency that they're willing to share with the rest of reality. Based on the individualism, they have their own frequency as well. The higher individual frequency they have, the less they are influenced by outside frequencies, or vice versa. They have very little individualism, and so they just grab the tail in front of them and hang on for dear life. You will always find the people that go with the flow, and I don't mean go with the flow in life, but go with trends and whatever's on TV and whatever food's popular, whatever clothing brand is popular, you will find unequivocally, I'm just going to tell you, it's not a fucking maybe, you will find a shallow human being. I don't mean bad human being, I just mean shallow. Extremely impressionable. You could lie to them about anything and they'll go, oh really? You know, and the next statement is, I like chewing gum, you know. This is what we're dealing with as a fabric of society. But those that take control of their own mind, which is a muscle, right? It's just like a muscle that atrophies. You can start giving up in reality and go with the flow. And you can say, oh my God, I hate this. What am I did that for? And you pull back into your own reality. Now, now imagine you take all these different people with their different levels of individualism and outward social sharing hive mind nature and you draw them to a single point in time. Luke, 
I'm your father. No, I'm your father. The whole world sees that. Now, I gave you two, two types of people. Someone who's an individual and someone who's a hive minder slash tail grabber. Can't think for themselves. There was an interesting phenomenon that went around, and if you guys, I'll try to link it in the bottom. Uh, it's utterly fascinating, okay? There's this weird sound that happens, and you either hear the word Yanny, Y-A-N-N-Y, or Lauren. Those two don't even rhyme. And I go, Rrr. Rare, you know, it'll, it'll give that saying, and then it changes the pitch. And we were sitting in a room in my smoke lounge, and the guy owns the place. He goes, I, I hear Lauren, Lauren now. And I'm still hearing Yanny, loud and clear. And then it goes down all of a sudden, I hear Lauren. I'm like, God damn, like that's just crazy, right? What is fascinating about the Mandela effect, okay, is it's always a binary effect. You either remember it this way, or you remember it that way. There's never a third person that goes, you know, Darth Vader actually never said, shit, I'm your dad, motherfucker. You know, it's like, it's like you don't hear that, right? It's, there's no third, there's just two. How is that possible? If there's a fallop in history, is it always a binary fallop? Well, you know, in half the part of the world we taught that uh, Eli Whitney's a white guy, and the other half we said is black. It was a social experiment just to see what happened, what would happen. Especially when this internet, th internet thing comes around, it's going to be hilarious to see them fight over it. The other person turns, the other one goes, well, they, do they know Mandela is still alive? <laughs> so what would cause the binary effect to happen? I'm not sure. But let's talk about injecting history. Now we know in history, uh, in history, the revisionists inject history all the time. That's not exactly what I'm talking about. Maybe some of you thought I was going there. Maybe you thought about that. Where they revise history, they put things in the past that didn't exist, like dinosaurs, potentially, right? Again, to review the dinosaur theory, very quickly, the first 40 years of dinosaur exploration, uh, paleontology, the two leading gentlemen who came up with all the discoveries were discovered to be charlatans and ha had lied the entire time they were digging things out of the ground. Then, the subsequent 100 years, 150 years after they got done, not quite 150 years, but all the things that were dug out of the ground still look like they're fake charlatan crap. That is a scam. Right? You can't make up what aliens look like and all of a sudden they show up and look exactly like the way you made them when you absolutely intentionally made them wrong. You can't fake Bigfoot and then all of a sudden he shows up and looks exactly like the furry costume you got out of the Halloween store. It doesn't work like that. And that's the story of dinosaurs. But now imagine if you could convince reality slash all the people that you have access to. Overwhelmingly, the dinosaurs existed. And the circular logic problem of time is that you made up a story, you used propaganda, television, movies, printed paper to tell kids that they existed, and then they manifested it into their reality such that now you could potentially dig up a dinosaur. And what do they look like? They look like the fakes that were initially created in the 1800s because that's how the theory started in the first place. Right? It's a logic loop. You're taking fakeness, making it real through belief, and then it actually inserts it in the past. And because some people are sitting around, you know, breathing through their mouth, they believe it too. And then the dinosaurs are real in their world. Man, I don't even believe in those things, right? But what is future and past? If you're like me and you don't really think time exists, it's merely an illusion created by the storage of history, right? Well, if you think about us being the vibrational waves of ethereal winds. There's only one particle type in the entire universe, and it's called ether. And either it's a vibrating ripple of transverse energy, or it is a dielectric ricochet, or an orbital magnetism wave. We're here. May all the same stuff. Somehow history has to be stored somewhere, physically, in the universe. It does. It cannot have a zero-mass situation. 
even if the container is infinite, there's an instance of infinity that you must account for. I'm starting to see time, or the illusion and the theory of time, as a cloud sphere around our bodies, around our souls. Anywhere you're pointing your consciousness, your view frustrum of your eyes is the future. What is behind you is, is a collection of states that you've already had. You've moved through them in a linear, forward fashion in paradigm in your mind. Okay. How many of you have ever gone on your hard drive and opened up an old Word document and modified it and hit saved and you felt kind of weird? You were like, my God, I just changed something that was really, really old. I changed an old letter I wrote my mother 12 years ago. Like, why would you do that? You know, you do, those are pristine documents that you wrote that were your term papers, your award-winning article at work, da, 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 right? But you can do it, can't you? And I'm suggesting that that's exactly what happens, is that we can actually just go back to the hard drive of our perceived past, right? Again, if the past isn't written in stone, just like the future isn't written in stone, holy shit. We can rewrite anything a second ago, a millennia ago, the beginning of time itself, of our existence, because there isn't really such a thing. We're always trying to solve for the is, right? How could we be an is? Hmm. You just are. That's it. You just are the is. Heh. Sounds funny, doesn't it? The Mandela effect, if it exists, may simply be an organic frequency of my episode, which is consensus reality, right? We concede that reality is the way we currently have group understood it. The reason why, like in my Mind Over Matter episode I just released, the reason why a crazy person can't change the universe and why someone can't fly is because the majority of us believe it either went a particular way and you're not allowed to change it, or we don't think it's possible. Can you imagine if the, rule of, the rules of physics in this universe was merely a consensus of us? That we discover mathematics as almost an imperative to explain the unexplainable. You know when they would say the earth is on the back of a turtle? Well, maybe back in the day when they believed the earth was on the back of a turtle, it was on the back of a turtle. When they believed the world was flat, it was flat. When they believed it was round, it was round. Center of the universe, not center of the universe. Expanding. Now the idea is, okay, are there facts about the universe that are locked, and even though man doesn't understand it, they're still locked? And I would say yes. And I'm not convinced we're really changing things just yet, or that we ever have. I'll give you an example for me that's pretty interesting. I cannot stop thinking about my episode I, I did on Do Craters Exist? I'm the only dude on planet fucking Earth that I know of that has poet posed this theory quite bluntly that I think they're volcanic eruptions. Now, the one thing I had heard before I made my episode was that someone said that the, the moon might simply be an expired sun. I love that idea. Love it, love it, love it. When I did the interview with Bart Sabrell, and I found those photographs to overlay on top of the interview, and I finally found the photograph of the center of a volcano that has a spout down the center. It's even kind of like, a, almost looks like a birdbath. It's kind of made a little thing as it kind of slowly comes out, and now it was spinning some of that debris out on the inner uh, dish of the actual impression, which looks like a crater, okay? And then I showed the picture on the moon with the crater that was glowing in the center, and you can see the spibbles of lava or plasma energy or whatever it is, because it seems to be pure, pure white, on the inside of the crater. 
it's a volcanic eruption crater. And if the whole surface of the moon was boiling at some point, that would mean it might have been a sun. Uh, which really does call into all the other theories about what shape the world is and all that good stuff, right? So I believe, for me, personally, it was either created out of a, a remedial understanding of meteorites and how they slam into the surface of spheres. You know, our, our moon's vector is insane. It has its own rotation. It's going around the... Earth. The Earth is going around the sun. Let's just say you take all the official stories, right? And here comes this thing from outer space. I don't know. You can't throw a curveball that would spin in so many directions. You couldn't. And so there's nothing that's going to hit the moon perpendicular to the surface, right? At some point, a rock's going to hit tangent to the curve, and it's going to take a big elliptical slice out of that surface and it's never happened it's never happened on earth and it's never happened on the moon therefore meteorites hitting surfaces may be complete fucking bullshit and anyone selling fear of that nature is either ignorant or one of them same goes for solar flares people but injecting history when the secret came out Shortly after the movie, What the Bleep Do We Know, came out. It was fascinating because the, the What the Bleep Do We Know, and that's actually a movie title. You know, you know, how dare them, you know, risk saying a dirty word. What the Bleep Do We Know is a quantum physics version of the secret. The only person they put in that movie, which I wish they hadn't, is this woman who's title is channeler okay they absolutely took a shit on the credibility of the film by putting her in there but there are neurobiologists in there quantum physicists in there i mean it's it's insane it's really beautiful and they explain it on a scientific level the secret it's much more consumer oriented same exact theory the more that you believe something it can come true and all forms of reality including how you program your body to be in shape even though you're not exercising you can do it your neural peptides will absolutely build arnold schwarzenegger's body as long as you believe it i met a guy in laguna that was popeye never worked out but i'm telling you that his muscles were so huge um, he had three sons too and they just spent their entire life going to school and going to the beach this guy never worked out he could paint with both of his hands at the same time and write two different sentences at the same time. I mean, think about that. It's one thing to write with both hands, but it's one thing to have two levels of consciousness to, to write two sentences saying the different thing at the same time. Crazy. So you can do all this kind of stuff. But one thing that The Secret said in their marketing material, which I thought was brilliant, I, and when I heard it, it was sort of gimmicky. I was like, oh, yeah, whatever. But now I don't know. I'm thinking about it a little bit more. And they essentially said... The most powerful rich people in the world know this is true. And they've been trying to keep this information, keep the secret from you that this is the way the universe works. And it was that you can dial in your own reality. Well, if time is an illusion, uh, and, and what's important about time being an illusion versus a reality is the paradigm of how time functions, not the fact that you don't have awareness of time. Okay, so it'd be kind of like, it's somewhat, somewhat like saying the racetrack is an, an illusion. And you're like, what the fuck are you talking about? Okay, you, got in, you think you got in that race car and you drove, right? Yeah, of course, I did it. I went and saw different parts of the track. I was at lap one, then lap two, and then 50 laps later, I won the, uh, whatever, Indy 500. And I say, you know what? Let me show you how this works. I take you into a room that's a virtual reality room where you sit inside of a simulator and I turn it on, and there's a display around you. The sound's there, the smell's there, the car shakes and turns and gives you the feeling. I put this helmet on you that's really tiny and lightweight. It's a you know 16K monitor that talks to your 
talks to the rods and cones in your eye and all of a sudden you're in brainstorm 1981 and you're like, oh my God, this was an illusion. I said, you see, it's not that you're not racing in a race car track in your brain. It's just, it's not actually physically taking you around the world. And that is your analogy for time. Time is a stationary thing that is a simulation around you, not an actual physical location that you travel to. You've never moved since you were born. You're a node in a circuit. You don't need to feel bad about that. You need to enjoy life, right? So what's strange is, is that we have all the faith in the world as human beings that we can control the future, you know, and forget the secret, but we can work hard and get a better job. We can take care of our body and get healthier, you know, blah, 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 blah. But we don't think we can go backwards because we think the past is written in stone. Hmm. What's interesting for me studying the studying Egyptology is that it would seem, and this is, you know, there's very rational reasons why this could be occurring. I don't mean to be an idiot, but they were a recent discovery to mankind. Do you realize that? You know, they were still digging up Egypt in the 1790s when Napoleon's guy discovers the Rosetta Stone. We don't really understand hieroglyphs as translated from heretic and Hebrew. And then we figured out it's a phonetic language, not an iconic language. And then we start figuring out, put in air quotes, how they work. Then we start digging out the pyramids and the Sphinx. And as we theorize what these things were, it would seem that in some cases we, we go belly up. You know, like the, the pyramids being a tomb, it's not enough. They're not a tomb. But well, then what were they? Oh, we think they're a battery supply. Well, now, what if when we theorized about what the pyramids were and we said they were tombed because we found some big sarcophagi in the center of one of them, thinking that was a tomb for a human being? Could have been. We forgot that you would need special lighting to get in there, torches, and so we forgot to stain the walls in our brains with torches. And so now we realize, oh, my God, there's no way they could have lived in those things because... They would have had to have burned torches and the walls would have been scorched and da da da. So then we re engineer the theory that they're, they're batteries. You see where I'm going? 3200 BC sounded like a long time ago in the 1790s, but now when we look at overall history of the world, 3200 BC is yesterday and the, t the buildings don't seem modern enough to be in 3200 BC. It seems like they, they're older, so our brain takes it back to 39,000 BC and recent discoveries. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it just keeps going and going. It's like the history of the past is just as innovative and uh, reinventing as the present and the future. Where you would expect Apple to come up with a new device to play music, right? This is where paradigms become bone-crushingly important. If you lock your mind or let others tell you how things work all the fucking time, then you will never have a thought for yourself and you'll become a serf to absolute, utter ignorance and indoctrination. However, in their defense, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe I'm just a, an artist like you and we're all painting this canvas of time. We're painting a little over here, two seconds ago, two seconds in the future. We're painting it 3,000 years in the past, 50 years and 1,000 years in the past. You know? So it's a subjective, well, you can participate if you want. You can be an artist of time if you want. A time load. Or you can just sit here and live and enjoy the now. Sit on that porch in Kansas. Sit there on the edge of the dock, fishing. Having a conversation about nothing or everything. The internet has been an amazing, amazing experiment in that it is almost as if the entire world has been invited to a party line. And for those of you who don't know what that is, you're younger. I've only experienced a party line once in my life, which is the following. When the telephone companies were trying to distribute television or telephones to everyone's house, they didn't really have the switch technology to give each individual house in rural America their own telephone number, thus their own line, you know, 
So you had a party line. And party lines were, you know, I think there must have been about 20 houses on one line at one point when I was a kid. And I think we all had our own phones, but it was, uh, you had this party line as well in your house. It was strange. You could pick up the phone, and there's a whole, the whole neighborhood's on that phone. And you just have to be kind, like a good Skype call, where you have a party line when you have like more than two people talking on the line at the one time. You know, just take turns talking. That's a party line. And the internet has been the ultimate party line. All the discussions in the YouTube channel on YouTube for this channel, well, you're all hive mining together. And the more you get into the comments and read them, and some of the, some of the videos I do, you guys just go nuts. It's awesome. Like, I'll come back and there's 150 comments on a video. For me, that's huge. Absolutely huge. Like 10,000 views, 150 comments. That's over 1% of everyone who watched the movie comment. That's pretty cool. You know what's interesting about man, and one of the principal designs of paradigms is that man, you know, however we got here, there was, it's safe to say that we had no control at one point, or perceived lack of control, or very little control of ourselves. And the more we become modern, air quotes, we gain control. And so most of the paradigms that we believe or that was, I said we believe, quote, unquote, are based on par principles of control. Gosh, sounded really strange. We want time to be controlled. We want our lives to be controlled, our careers to be controlled, our health to be controlled. Everything's control, 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 because that shows superiority. A lot of the, the movie arcs that are out there are superhero, or I should say bad guys, antagonists that... I'm going to control the universe, right? The dipshits that we allow to run the world. Absolute moronic politicians run by moronic bankers, sociopathic elite families of the world in their own little brain. It's all about control, control, control. Let me give you an idea of how powerful the notion of history is okay there's two types of histories if i said to you titus flavius of rome had red hair there is next to nothing i could do to ever prove that to you you would either have to believe me or not believe me uh, the physical proof would be well somehow he was mummified by egyptian folks and there's a hair follicles lying around somewhere and we could test it for pigment, and oh, yep, he was Scottish, and he was a dwarf. I don't know. I mean, it was something. He was he was red hair, and then you could perhaps add some principal discovery to it. That's what anthropologists do, trying to figure out what's going on, right? What has gone on? But there's plenty of tales that we pass around all the time about people that existed that did, that never existed. One of the most famous people in world history never existed, ever. He never existed. Isn't that amazing? We have a bunch of people, academics, it's hilarious, who go around saying that this person existed, but he never, ever existed. Not ever. And we have injected him into our past. We not only injected him into our past, but we injected him in a way that he has ultimate authority over the entire fucking universe. But he never, ever existed. And neither did two other dudes who are part of the same story. They did amazing things. They never existed either. Not ever. They are myths, and I'm not saying they're bad myths, but they've been, they've been used. Anytime you create a, a knife, for instance, you've created an amazing invention. It takes no ammunition, a moron can use it, and it's lethal, it's also useful. But it depends on how you use the knife as to whether or not it's perceived as a negative object or positive object, but as soon as the object has power to accomplish something, 
that no other object can accomplish. You can take it evil or good. Isn't that an interesting principle? And so you can take a myth and turn them positive, and you can take a myth and turn them negative. You could fight crusades and kill innocent people in the name of a fucking myth. You can still kill countries all over the world in the name of myths. And their myths fight your myths, you know? So we see this happen all the time. We inject fiction into our past to sort of rewrite either what is missing from our past or to cover up the boring past or a shitty past. You know, we faked... Well, I shouldn't say we. The moon missions were faked. They were. Sorry, sorry, sorry. If your butt puckers up when you hear that, it was faked. It's not your fault. It's not my fault. I didn't do it. You didn't do it. But they were faked. But the interesting byproduct of faking that was that they inspired a bunch of us kids to get into science. I think that if they hadn't faked the moon missions, my knowledge of all all areas of physics and perhaps electronics and perhaps even computers would have never materialized. In fact, the people that invented the equipment that I used, maybe the equipment wouldn't have, wouldn't have been made. So the myth of going to the moon is extremely powerful. Extremely powerful. So perhaps injecting things in our past, much more than just a myth, but in physical reality, maybe that's important for our development. We know that our paradigms today offer us the growth vector of what we call the future. This is the famous line, you don't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. It's almost like a linear version, a two-dimensional version of the famous statement, as it is above, so too it is below. Well, if the future is just as malleable as the past, then both have an equal impact on our character. And both would be equally important to our character. We don't have eyes in the back of our heads. At least I don't. And so I perceive where I'm walking is sort of more the future. And what's behind my head is a metaphor for where I've been, even if I walk in a circle. Where I was just then, where I was just then, right? where I'm going, where I'm going. The Mandela effect that I mentioned at the beginning of the episode seems like, again, if, it, if its cause is anything other than the CERN Hadron Collider, okay, it's an organic occurrence. It's either, it's either organic in the uh, sorting out of history that has been poorly taught around the world, or it is truly being molded and grown in a petri dish as we consent to a particular image of history. When I think of this stuff, I don't know about you, but it is massively liberating for me personally to let go of paradigms that seem to have frustrated my existence since I gained sentient control over this vessel. And to be free of it is phenomenal. I can move in all directions now in time. I can look at history in a completely different way. Now, when I first recorded this last night, one of the things I said was that we want proof. I said this in the Mind Over Matter episode, too, but we want proof that this isn't all just a bunch of hunches, right? You could probably define a fairly insane mind by saying that the only thing that a person, if a person was just full of hunches and never was able to take it over the barrier into confirmation, under some bias, of course, of realization, then you might go insane because you're just like, 
it's all just unconfirmed, unconfirmed. A man, I think, needs to have confirmation. Otherwise, we'll go crazy with our loop of curiosity. Look at the Big Bang Theory. I mean, this is a very interesting sociological experiment you can do on the scientists that have held on to this ridiculous theory that at least as defined is a complete, <laughs> it's just hilarious how bad this theory is. But they're sitting around in, you know, Cambridge University, uh, you know, blowing the dust off this old theory, which had been around for a while. And they can sit around and talk all they want. They could have sat around for one decade, meeting 12 hours a day, seven days a week, even 16 hours a day and sleeping eight, right? They could have done that. And at no point in their journey are they ever going to find the utter proof of the Big Bang. They certainly can't witness it, because in their theory, it was before all things were created in the universe, right? So at some point, someone in the room said, Fuck it. Let's just tell everyone it happened. And we'll use the, the media, the movies, television, books. I mean, hey, we have our own publishing company at Cambridge University. We got Isaac fucking Newton in here. And now we got this young kid with Lou Gehrig's disease, Stephen W. Hawking. He's so bright and he's so innocent and so wonderful. People are going to believe him, and he wants to believe it, and so let's just say it happened, and let's just see what happens. And then they go, okay. And then kaboom. Neil deGrasse Tyson is born. Packed to the brim with bullshit. We see this happen all the time. The true danger of that process is that they just close the minds of every kid who would have otherwise found, perhaps, where we did come from. How the mass did get distributed in this big, seemingly infinite container. Won't even look anymore. You know. And you can't bring up string theory sometimes, because the Big Bang doesn't like the string theory. Well, if the guy, I uh, forgot, it was like Dr. Green or something, I can't remember the guy's name, but if that poor guy who came up with the string theory has to sit around and kiss the ass of all the ignorant tenure professors who haven't done a lick of fucking research in their lives, the only intellectual thing they ever did was write their doctor's uh, thesis, their PhD thesis, and then they taught out of books their whole life, and they write a paper of a bunch of blathering crap every once in a while to try to suck some money into the, uh, into the university, but they're not really innovative, innovating anything. They're not out there doing scientific experiments confirming anything. They take their check, they go home, and they shut up. They make sure electricity costs a shit ton of money. Zero-point energy projects are never greenlit. We went to the moon, et cetera, et cetera. Well, when Christianity came around, and everyone who lived through that time said, what are you talking about, Jesus? We lived in Rome. Right when you said this guy existed, he didn't exist. There wasn't any big crucifying moment where some dude was up there, and then he was pulled down and resurrected. We were there. What, that cave over there? That's my uncle's cave. He used to keep his beer in there. Nobody was raised from there. No one ever came out. No one pushed a rock open. I was there the summer of whatever, 0 AD that you're calling it. He never existed. And then Rome gets angry. He says, this is our new control apparatus. This is how we're going to put another thousand years on the Barbie to make sure that we don't die. And so they start the Crusades where they killed a bunch of Christians in their first raid. It was really brilliant. And then they start the Inquisitions, forcing into the brain of man for 900 years in three different phases the belief in Christ. When a child would have a baby on average at 15 years old, I mean, that's when a generation turned over to the next generation at 15 years. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Well, Jesus Christ, of course we believe in this bullshit today. It's been driven into your brain. You have no genetic fucking hope of not believing in this guy, especially if your parents taught it to you. Unless one thing happens. You start thinking for yourself. So these tenure professors do exactly the same thing. They're an inquisition on your mind, galvanizing probably false paradigms of the past. Now, 
again, if the past is organic, is as organic as the future, then there's probably no necessary crime going on. I would say the only crime that they would be committing would be a pretty existential one, which is that man uh, is having his true existentialism robbed from him because he is no longer a part of the universe. He's a part of a subjugated serfdom that reports to the monarchy, like Canada and Australia. They report to the EU. They, you know, report to some other entity. They don't own themselves. but are always the subjugated ones, right? The big improvement that we have to make in mankind right now is to push all these people back. Neil deGrasse Tyson has to go from hero to zero. Done. Bill Nye, the douchebag guy, he's not even fucking invited to talk. He has no education of any fucking level that's interesting. See you later. You played a fictional character in some Seattle television show, or they gave you the title of science guy. At least Neil deGrasse Tyson's got a PhD. At least he could change his ways, stop saying the fucking world's a pair, and, you know, go from Saul to Paul, right? He's a serial killer of true science. He could go from that into the truth movement and say, you know what? First things first, I don't know shit. That's the first thing Neil deGrasse Tyson has to say. I don't know shit. I'm just like all you guys. I don't know shit. But here's what I'm going to do. Neil deGrasse Tyson needs to say, I'm a smart person. And now that my heart has been straightened out, and I've stopped taking paychecks to fuck over little kids' brains, I'm going to figure out what the truth is. I'm going to stop hanging out with stuffy old tenure professors. I'm going to start hanging out with some edgy kids who are, who are definitely strung out on some crap, for sure. But that's the penalty of opening your mind, taking away the filter, this little template in front of your brain that says, well, let that in, don't let that in, right? It's like one of those coin sorter things, right? When you get a PhD in this country... Well, you could have taken everything from a penny to a quarter to a half dollar to a Susan B. Anthony, but now you got your degree and you can only accept dimes. The smallest form of information. You Brits, it's a P, right? I don't even know. It's funny. It was <laughs> when I went to Britain, the amount of uh, dollars slash pounds, British sterling, in coin... It was really cool. Like they had a five pound coin. I remember translating my money and I got a bunch of little coins and I'm like, this is five on it. And I'm thinking five cents and it's actually five pounds. And I'm like, I'm tipping the, the cabbie once for dropping me off at the British Museum. I remember I was, it's like a 45 minute ride through London. And I gave this guy like five pounds and he literally looked at me. He was angry and he goes, no, 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 that's too much. What do you have? And he just takes a, small, a couple of smaller coins out of there, and he goes, he drove off, and I was like, wow. He was so ethical. He took lesser money. That was awesome. Do we inject things into our past? I don't know, man. I think it could be an illusion that is created through sheer discovery, but I, I do feel like certain theories just turn into fractals. It just keeps getting, like the more you zoom in, there's more there and there's more you zoom. The more you go down the rabbit hole, the rabbit hole, like a video game, like Diablo or something, three, it just generates it in front of you infinitely because you're inquisitive. And if time has no rule, time is infinitely divisible. Reality is infinitely divisible and it's infinitely um, multiplied like you can make it as big as you want or as tiny as you want you can divide and multiply whatever you want to do it goes infinite we know that's the way the universe works right we know that's the way the number sets in our brains work is it the same above as it is below because if that's the case holy shit time itself you know look at the the cameras that shoot a million frames per second nowadays they can see the light going through 
a, uh, a bottle of water. What does that do? They've divided time one million times in one second. Well, I'm sure they're right around the quarter from 10 million frames per second or 100 million frames per second. And when they get there, they're probably going to discover something more about how the universe works. And then they'll probably hide it because it reveals too much power to us. But that's why these cool indie channels on YouTube are really fun. Somehow this guy gets hold of a camera that would otherwise cost $50,000, has no monetary purpose. I mean, we can do call people up, hey, do you have anything I can film in a million frames per second that then you could turn into marketing material that would help you sell an air conditioner? Uh, what? You know. But they get these amazing inventions and they do amazing things with them. It's really, really cool. When I learned that an electron microscope has to be logged to the United States government, so if you have one, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, this is what I've heard three times in my lifetime, that if you own one of these things, you have to register it with the United States government, and then every single experiment that you run in the thing has to be logged with the university that then is filtered up to the government. It is an honor system, all right? There's no videotape, as far as I know, handed in with it. I don't know if today all they had to do is say, every time you turn the electricity on, the pictures go to the government. And then you'd, it'd be hard to turn it on without uh, the government knowing what you did. But there's probably old machines out there that can do it that don't have that capability shit i don't know but it's like go fuck yourself if i can afford this piece of equipment i'm not making plutonium rods for fuck's sake i'm just looking at teeny tiny elements of the universe what are you worried about dude what are you worried about me discovering because if you're worried that means you've already discovered it yourself and you're just trying to keep me from doing it you know, what I would love to hear from anyone who knows more about this is someone that registers a, an experiment inside an electron microscope and someone getting denied, right? The letter comes back and says, you're not to do that. I don't get the sense that there's some sort of ecosystem that does that, right? That you ask and you get approved and then you get to do it and it's going straight up to some deep state uh, laboratory. I don't think that that's even possible without just absolutely ganking the world. I absolutely do believe that we have history that is really there. Whether it be the architecture of our ancestors, which would be the case if, if it is all conceptual and consensus-based. You know, they found this huge... I'll give you an example. Uh, they found the huge... Well, what they say is a, a meteor impact crater just north of South America. It's the dinosaur killing extinction event thingy, right? It is seemingly massive. It seems like it would not be an eruption out of the center of the Earth. But it also seems so utterly massive that if it was a rock that did it, this planet might have just simply ceased to be round and it might have had to reconstitute from scratch like an earth killer. And I don't mean species, I mean shape, right? What's interesting about that theory is that if a rock were to hit the surface of the earth and create such a crater, then the soil at the center of that sphere, of that circle, excuse me, would have to be very thin because it just was pulverized fairly recently, a few hundred million years ago, which ain't shit with the lifespan of our planet, which is supposedly, what, uh, randomly three and a half billion years old, right? Where they get these numbers, man, you know, it, it, unbelievable how they theorize this stuff. I mean, you know, hats off for theorizing it, but publishing books that says this is de facto it. I've got a book called 3.5 Billion Years. It's sort of laughable when you wake up but it'd be funny to drive around neighborhoods with the ice cream truck song blaring on your stereo <laughs> and everybody comes out and it's just you just driving around everyone's neighborhood. So in closing, let's, let's wrap it up with the, a big what if. What if we're right in this episode? The time is just as malleable going backwards as it is going forward. 
that we live in a cloud of recorded events, recorded states. Just like the car, race car track, this is a simulation. We're not really going around a track. It's all being simulated. What if this video, and I'm not trying to make something happen here, but just say this video were to go as viral as Gundam style, right? It gets out there and a billion people watch this video and a billion people think this thing through. And mine's 50,000 times more brilliant than my own or yours. Really dig this down and find out that it's true, that there could be proven. It's no longer a hunch anymore. It's proven. Mandela effect goes from being this crazy side theory to being the next, uh, what is it, 2012 thing where the Mayan calendar said we're all going to cease to exist, right? There's books published on it. Da, 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 da. Do we run the risk of undoing reality? Or do we gain unbelievable control? I don't necessarily feel smart enough to control my reality <laughs> at all, right? I, there's a bunch of wind blowing and leaves flapping around in front of me. I got a rose bush over there, palm tree over there, some big thing here, bougainvillea that, right there. I don't want to have to concentrate on all that stuff. But now what if we look at some of the past events that have taken place that we really regret took place? And we, I don't know, we get together in a big giant global campfire and then we sing some new equivalent of Kumbaya where uh, somebody drops the bass and we undo it. In fact, we think about flying saucers and they land, right? We can do anything we want. And again, we must pay heed to the theory inside Forbidden Planet such that our id, our inner consciousness doesn't go absolutely crazy. The guy that's just holding his mind together and his life together, who is like one second away from going full-blown serial killer or mass killer or whatever. He's on a bunch of pharmaceuticals his school gave him when he was in grade school. You know, but to be careful with that kid. Maybe it's some way to rehabilitate those people. You take a really unstable person and just like jumping in a lake of Lake Havasu and you let it soothe your soul and your frequency down, we soothe them. Take a homeless person who's struggling to keep the voices out of their head because of malnutrition and true isolation. They talk to themselves and they hear voices. I mean, they really hear them. And we put them in a room with a bunch of people and we think at them. We're creating an environment that's unbelievable. And they just sort of normalize. There's no... There's no uh, medicine other than like, chemical cocktails they put in their bodies. Maybe it's surrounding them with gigantic crystal chambers. And we think at the crystals and we think at them. And they just started getting injected with real calm spirits. You know, after we're all done, we'll take them to the hemp clothing store, get them all set up. Secretly, this is sort of a related topic. I have this hope that someone as renowned as Neil deGrasse Tyson does flip-flop away from indoctrinated science. That he, like the kids who made loose change that exposed 9-11, that they went in to debunk the conspiracies and end up making the most convincing film of all time that it was truly a conspiracy. Now, th those events are horrible and what have you, but I'd, I would settle for the fabric of the universe being opened back up with the fabric of consciousness opened up, with paradigms being erased or at least loosened up to be more symbolic and allegorical until we can really shake out if anything at all is truly set in stone. I think every man, woman, and child can conceive of some sort of simulator to the universe. Some place where you could flip a switch, time would cease to progress in terms of your aging process or what have you, but you would have your own simulation. 
You could bring facsimiles of your friends and family in there or people you don't know. You could make a human being that you simply doesn't exist. Have a conversation with them. You could pull in Faraday and Tesla and Einstein all in the same room and have a conversation and sort through it all. You could sort through it as they existed on Earth. You could sort through it maybe as their celestial spirit once they left and figured out they were either right or wrong. We can conceive of that pretty simply. But that's a universe with no boundaries. When we, make, when we make video games, okay, it is truly the art of creating that universe and then applying rules to create a style guide and a feeling to create false lore. Well, if we can conceive that today, in 2018, then I think it's at least possible that the universe itself could be as malleable, that all we're doing is echoing the algorithms of freedom that are in the universe today. I think you feel me. DeepThoughtsRadio.com for all the feeds, audio, video, locked Facebook group, Patreon page, and a little teeny tiny store. Please comment in the comment section what you're thinking. The comments have become so rich. Um, uh, I want to say hi to everyone who does post in the comments. Again, I haven't said this in a while, but when I read your comment, I will click the thumbs up button. The thumbs up button, in most cases, 99% of the cases, I am really enjoying your comment. But even if you're like, you're an asshole, blah, 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 I'll click your comment, I'll click the thumbs up, and that just means I, I read it. You got to me. I read it. You didn't get to me, but I, I heard what you said. We have a pretty much an 80% conversion rate of folks that come in and... Um, criticize the book cover and come back for more. So that's pretty good. Anyway, take care of yourself and someone else and I'll see you in the next Deep Thoughts. Over now.